Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. Is it weird to say this game shaped my summer of 2021? Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl is another addition to the Nickelodeon Brawl series, which is mostly comprised of some really weird 2D fighter flash games. This game is a special entry because Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl is a Smash Bros style platform fighter instead. It's also a game that I've covered quite a bit on this channel, but considering I also reviewed a couple other Smash clones to the lead up of this game's release, it was only a matter of time before I gave this a full review too. And now that the game is confirmed complete with a sequel game on the horizon, it seems like this is the best time to finally revisit the game and see what went well and what went wrong. I now have the opportunity to talk about something I didn't get to discuss in the Brawl Out or Punch Time Explosion reviews, mostly because there wasn't much of a noteworthy hype train for either game, or at least, I didn't witness them firsthand. Those games I discovered after they were put on store shelves. This time, thanks to quite a few YouTubers, including Choctopus and Maximilian Dude, I discovered this game's existence soon after it was announced to the world. And this game came out swinging with its announcement trailer. Looking back, it's actually pretty unimpressive, because all it does is speedrun showing off 14 of the playable characters and some of their animations. There was also gameplay, but I mean, they were all one second clips each where you couldn't tell what the hell was going on because of the transitions and the janky animations that we all thought at the time were still works in progress we were wrong. At the time, it did what it had to. They knew we were familiar with Smash Bros, so instead of using this as a way to pitch the gameplay we understood, it was made to highlight the spectacle of the crossover. Get ready, because you'll soon be able to witness Spongebob vs. Leonardo vs. Invader Zim vs. freaking Nigel Thornberry in an official video game. So yeah, people were excited, but a lot, me included, stayed somewhat skeptical considering how other similar Smash clones flopped in the past. What gave some optimism was the reveal that Swedish indie game dev studio Ludosity would be developing this game. They showed passion for Smash Bros and the platform fighter genre with their original game, Slap City, so fans were expecting that same kind of love for the Nickelodeon Smash Bros 2. I was aware of Slap City before Nick All-Stars, but hadn't played it. So now, I get to interrupt this Nick All-Stars review for a quick Slap City review. I picked this game up before Nick All-Stars to see if it really was an enjoyable, passion-filled game. I'd argue it was. The game was floaty, but fun. It could have used a tune-up here and there, but for an indie game that was trying to do its own thing while still being close enough to Smash, it did a good job. The overall lack of polish and cast of weirdos, though, makes this game a bit forgettable. But for some short fun here and there, and if you can get the game on sale, you can get some good joy and entertainment. With Slap City in mind, it's no wonder why people thought there was hope for Nick All-Stars. Was it spectacular enough to fully convince some like me? Unfortunately, no. The hype train was still going strong with a new mini-trailer on Game Mill's official YouTube channel. Game Mill being the publisher of Nick All-Stars, as well as the Nickelodeon Kart Racers trilogy. This announced the fact that eight more characters were to be revealed, with two being revealed at the 2021 Future Game Show. Remember this, because it will be very important later. Also around this time, there were leaks that made it clear that some of these characters would be Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender, Korra from The Legend of Korra, Ren and Stimpy, and Catdog. And then the future game show happened. 
So then, after being introduced by Lady D, two awkwardly showcased back-to-back -back trailers announced the next two fighters, one of which matching the leak. I guess they both did, but no one looked at this silhouette and thought it was April O'Neil. And then came even more leaks, further confirming those other leaked characters, while also suggesting Toph would be another playable avatar rep, and the last two of the promised eight, who evidence pointed towards being Garfield and the Shredder, would be added through a later patch, not being finished for the base roster like promised. Something definitely wasn't right here. From the weird planning, executions, and behind-the-scenes anomalies, there were more reasons to lean on the more skeptical side when it came to this game. Then they'd go ahead with gameplay demonstrations for the overall game mechanics and each individual character. Oh, and a random drop of Ren and Stimpy's reveal. These showcases, however, showed off some troubling things as well. There was no sign of any voice acting, much like the first two Nick Kart Racers games, and those quick and janky animations from earlier footage were actually what this game was going for. Yeah, some characters have some neat movesets with some neat references, but when they look like test animations, the wow factor dies quite a bit. And there was even more behind-the-scenes strangeness with these showcases, because while they were all being shared on Game Mill's YouTube channel, some were released elsewhere, leaving quite some time before Game Mill's YouTube channel would have them. And then we got showcases for characters who hadn't even been revealed yet. I guess they were like, the Avatar characters have already been leaked, screw giving them official, thoughtful reveals. I think this is also why Korra straight up has no reveal, unlike the other characters who got revealed after the first trailer. Like, did they give up? Did they run out of time? Did they rage quit? Then came the game's launch on the same day that Sora was announced to be closing Smash Ultimate. And wouldn't you know it. No voice acting, janky animations, and a roster of only 20 when a previous trailer promised 22. The hype train wouldn't end there, though it felt more like getting off at the wrong stop and having to walk the rest of the way to the destination, with most of that experience being nothing interesting. Sure, some cool stuff here and there, but yeah, mostly nothing. More content was confirmed to be on the way, with us getting a good idea of what through data mining. There was in-game data for things like an alternate skin for each fighter, items, other stages, special icons for Garfield and the Shredder, the movesets for Garfield and Shredder, and unused announcer calls. Interestingly enough, there was also extra stuff related to Rocksteady from TMNT found through data mining. It's unknown as to why. Like, were they really considering rock steady for the roster? Anyways, most of these would end up getting polished up and released through future free updates, including Garfield and the Shredder finally completing this game's outlined roster four months after the game's release. And then the game would finally get everything you'd realistically expect from the data mines once items were finally added eight months after the game's release. So really, they should have set this game's release date to June 6th, 2022, instead of October 5th, 2021, if they really wanted to release a more complete version of their game. But I still wouldn't argue fully complete. They also later rolled out paid DLC, with packs including Jenny from My Life as a Teenage Robot, Hugh Neutron from Jimmy Neutron, and Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life. Because, yeah, we showed how we're willing to release Nickelodeon Man Sky, so give us more money for more content. And then came silence after Rocco's release, as they would, within a year, reveal the sequel game. So yeah, quite the wild ride. And quite the lengthy one to recap. Well, at least that concludes this mini-episode of What Happened. From an art style standpoint, this game does a good job. It had the difficult task of creating a look that would fit for all of these characters from varying art styles, and created something that unified them all pretty well. I find it kind of funny that a selling point for Nick All-Stars 2 is the improved graphics. I still question if this was all that necessary. 
It's cool, yeah, but why? The UI is good, simple, and straight to the point. The character select screen is kind of weird, because after they finally added alternate costumes, character portraits became semi-transparent. That is, until you view the alternate costume, then both the normal and alt portraits are no longer transparent. That's just... weird? The audio is loud AF, so be ready to turn the master volume down. As previously mentioned, this game had no voice acting at launch. The only voice acting in this game came from the announcer, who does a decent job, but did we really need him to have a bunch of mid-match one-liners like Space Ghost and PTE? Speaking of PTE, I went into detail in my review on how poor of a job they did when assembling their voice cast. But now I have to say that PTE technically did a better job with his voice cast than Nick Allstars because they at least got SOME of the original voice actors at launch. And even when they couldn't, they still got SOME VAs to voice each character. Nick Allstars had NOTHING. Instead, they relied on over-the-top sound effects to convey certain actions, moods, or inspirations. But without the iconic voices of these iconic characters, this all feels uncanny. Sure, voices would be added later on, but this was still an unforgivable embarrassment. And isn't it kind of funny that we got voices around the same time Nick Kart Racers 3 got announced? Almost like Game Mill realized how fed up people were with these games skipping on the voice acting, that they got all of these voice actors to record lines for both the fighting game crossover and the kart racer crossover. Based on timing, they probably also recorded lines that would be reserved for Nick All-Stars 2. But hey, at least we have all of these legendary voice actors giving life to these characters yet again. Though, there are some aspects worth noting. All VAs re-recorded several of their characters' famous quotes, but obviously, since these were recorded long after those original takes, they sound very different and sometimes kind of off. Some lines had to be awkwardly performed to stay in pace with these quick and janky animations. Tom Kenny reprised his roles as Spongebob and Dog, but since they used a similar voice in their respective shows, Tom Kenny ended up doing a strange new take on Dog as to not blend with his Spongebob lines. Imagine this! I smell trouble! Let's get a soda. Cat, you know, fish are our friends too! Aang and Toph got new voice actors. This was done because their original VAs, Zack Tyler Eisen and Michaela Jill Murphy respectively, were child actors when they first voiced their characters. So now they got new children. Renee Jacobs didn't reprise her role as April, now being voiced by Abby Trot, aka the vocalist who performed Smash Ultimate's main theme, Lifelight. Why neither Nick Allstars nor TMNT Shredder's Revenge got Renee Jacobs back is unknown. I recall hearing she retired from voice acting, but I couldn't find any concrete proof of that. Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is I made it the fuck up! Shredder is voiced by Jim Cummings, who has voiced the 87 Shredder in the past. They obviously couldn't get the original 87 voice of Shredder, James Avery, due to his unfortunate passing in 2013. Similarly, the passing of Gary Owens in 2015 is why Powdered Toast Man is now voiced by David Kay. Tim Curry wasn't brought back to voice Nigel Thornberry, as he hasn't been as involved in acting ever since his stroke in 2012. Oblina was another case where the previous voice actress, Christine Cavanaugh, had long since passed in 2014, forcing a recast. Garfield is voiced by Scooby-Doo, aka Frank Welker. This is because he voiced Garfield in several CG Garfield movies and the Garfield show, the Garfield Show. Also, there's apparently a new Garfield film coming out next year, and I want you to take a wild guess as to who's voicing Garfield. If you guessed Brian Cranston, then you're wrong. It's Chris Pratt. Of course it's Chris Pratt. 
Koopas. Lastly, here's all of the voice actors that overlap between Nick All-Stars and Nick Kart Racers 3. The roster and voice cast of Nick Kart Racers 3 just helps sell the idea that these games were likely recorded around the same time as a way to capitalize and save on budget. Now that we're done with all that VA talk, let's continue with something else audio related. The soundtrack. It kinda sucks. They tried making tracks that fit with the musical style of each show, but most of them sound super generic and like white noise when fighting. Sure, some like Jellyfish Field, Sewer Slam, and Ghost Zone are rather decent, but then you get ones like Western Air Temple and Rooftop Rumble that sound so bland. Or ones like the Flying Dutchman Ship and the Dump that use stock screams as part of the tracks. Or ones like Glove World that... Make me want to cave my skull in. Yeah, the audio department didn't bring their A-game with this one. The gameplay is going to be difficult to talk about because it's got its pros and cons. Let's start by listing out everything you can do. Attacks are spread out into light, heavy, and special attacks. All of these have a neutral up and down variant based on how you tilt the stick. Some attacks even change what they do and look like if used in the air. Yes, that means you can do smash attack like heavy attacks in the air. You like how Min Min's the only one that can do this in Smash? Lights are like your standard jabs and tilts in Smash. Quick moves that don't launch as far, but can be used for combos. Heavies are, again, like your Smash attacks. They can't be charged, but they often have a bit of startup and end lag to compensate for their greater launch power. Also, they can reflect projectiles. Specials are... Well, they're specials. We know what those are. There are also the light and heavy dash attacks, both of which can be cancelled into any move upon landing the attack. You can also grab and throw opponents and projectiles, with each character having the same overhead grab and throw. You can even grab and throw in the air. Neat. For defense, you can block attacks, but you still take damage and can be pushed back or forced out of the blocking state. You can also parry, but I completely forgot this was a thing you could even do before re-watching the gameplay showcase on Game Mill's YouTube channel. Still, a neat change from the bubble shield. Until they decided to pivot back to the bubble shield for Nick All-Stars 2. You can also do air dodge dashes, which can help with evading and recovering, but let's be honest, we only care about them because you can wave dash with them. There's also the strafe button, which allows you to remain looking in the same direction as long as you have the button held. So everyone can freely activate the FGC character's 1v1 stance mechanic from Smash Ultimate whenever they choose. And last but not least, the taunt button. Every character gets a taunt animation, with the animations usually being reserved for memes or actions that fit with that character's traits or tropes. And now for the execution. The gameplay stays close enough to Smash that Smash fans like me can pick it up easily. It's different enough to be its own thing, but not too different where it can turn people away. Well, mostly. The biggest difference is in the rock, paper, scissors element. No, I'm not talking about attack, shield, and grab. This game has another rock, paper, scissors element that's so forgettable most of the time. Heavy attacks colliding with other heavy attacks can result in one of three effects based on which directional attack beats the other. You barely see or notice this, so while it is neat, it makes that extra gameplay layer weak. Yes, attacking, blocking, and grabbing are things in this game, but less focused than how they interact with each other in Smash. So if Rock, Paper, Scissors is out, how is combat oriented in this game? The easy answer is, it's not. The long answer is that the fast-paced nature means you have less time for planned out strategy and more of a focus on quick reactions and instincts to make combos on the fly. Of course, strategy is always an option, but you can also kind of turn off your brain and freestyle. Whether or not that's a bad thing is subjective. I honestly enjoy it. Mostly. It's good for giving you in-the-moment game plans and results in some crazy high-speed action. 
It's quick, it's snappy, it's easy, but is it for everyone? Some sacrifices had to be made when going for this speedy, competitive, friendly gameplay style. Firstly, how was this speed achieved? Through making quick animations. Oftentimes, too quick animations. 90% of moves and animations come out so fast that they not only look bad, almost like they're incomplete, but are also difficult to tell what they are. And you kind of need to know what moves you're doing if you want to succeed in a fighting game. Or any game for that matter. The high speed can also be a bit too hectic. Yeah, I know. You're just going to say the game is too fast for casuals. But, yeah, it kind of is. I'm not saying new players can't pick this up, or only pro gamers can get the most out of this game. The speed is an issue for all players. Because moves are so quick and easy to combo with, it can be easy to lock your opponent in a combo in which they have little to no options other than to endure until the combos end. This is most obvious with characters like down airs and how easy they can be to spam and turn your opponent into a basketball. Imagine being the one on the receiving end of this. Would you consider this game to be fun? And another flaw with this competitive focus is the game becomes less fun when you throw in more than two fighters in a match. Because of this game's heavy 1v1 identity, free-for-alls become less engaging as all you're left to do is either randomly dish out specials and heavy attacks, or single out one opponent to play the game in its intended combo-centric fashion. While getting footage, 4-man free-for-alls felt more like chores while the rest of the experience, all 1v1s, remained rather enjoyable. Casual multiplayer free-for-alls were not fun. Is Nickelodeon's target demographic supposed to enjoy this kind of experience? Are they expected to do and stick to the more competitive stuff rather than simple casual play? I get what the passionate Smash fans at Ludosity were going for here, but they built up one side of the spectrum so much that the other one got neglected in the process. They tipped the scales, but still came out with an imbalance. So the gameplay in a nutshell. Fun, but flawed. The roster consists of Nicktoons characters of old, new, and timeless. I have to specify Nicktoons because Nickelodeon also has plenty of live-action stuff. The only live-action representation, unless I missed something, is the Double Dare-inspired stage, Slime Time. The abundance of nostalgic 90s and early 2000s characters demonstrates how this roster was heavily inspired by the devs' nostalgia for what they grew up with. Which is cool because that nostalgia is shared with many others, hence why the idea of this game gained a fanbase in the first place. They'd also throw in newer characters, both to appeal to younger fans and because Nickelodeon would obviously want to highlight what they're currently working on and profiting off of. Speaking of Nickelodeon and Viacom's influences, they had to approve of all roster choices, which resulted in the devs having to fight hard to convince them to allow characters like Nigel Thornberry and Powdered Toastman to join the battle. Now at the end of the game's life cycle, the roster contains 25 characters, with a lot of choices being expected and greatly welcomed, but there are still some odd picks. Like, why only go with half of the Ninja Turtles? You either do one of them, or you do all of them. Don't cheap out or cast the other half aside for... freaking April! And then there are cases like Helga from Hey Arnold and Hugh Neutron from Jimmy Neutron. Why are they the sole representatives of their shows, but the actual main title characters are nowhere to be found? And, something that I kind of like and find very funny, the only playable character from the Rugrats is Reptar, not one of the main babies, the fictional serial mascot. I get why this was done, since Rugrats is definitely something worth representing, but having a baby in a fighting game would be questionable. Pichu. So yeah, we have a roster crafted based on expectations, nostalgia, and memes. Now let's take a look at each character. Apple. When Sakurai rejected him for Smash, Ludosity said, Fine, I'll do it myself. 
Star. He was known as the worst character for a while because his moves have a lot of startup and end lag. Speed up, Tubby! Tubby? Nobody calls me Tubby! <laughs> Diver. She's got some pretty good karate, inventions, and her own get over here attack. Kite. I only consider a few of his moves good. Clay. She's got some sick ground attacks, but some underwhelming air attacks. I guess that makes sense for an earthbender. Athlete. She's got an aerial falcon kick, the Ganon stomp, and a super high knockback neutral special. Rascal, the yo-yo specialist. Goth. Yeah, that's it. Okay, she's got things like a scythe, a coffin, and a vampire bite that I think does something? All because, what else would you expect from a goth? Moon. Probably the best character in the game because of the combination of quick moves and insane range. Pizza. Some of his moves are a bit awkward to land, but they can be pretty effective. And they look pretty cool. Reporter. Why April instead of the other two turtles? Why the version of April known for constantly getting kidnapped? Why make her a powerhouse of a fighter? Duo. This game's single skeleton duo with perfect Ren and Stimpy style insanity and grossness. Hero. He's wacky. But yeah, use that killer tongue and maybe also that shine if you're not a filthy poser casual like me. Alien. I like the idea of a spider-legged fighter, but that makes his moveset a bit weak. His only good move is his light neutral air, and I guess his specials can also be pretty helpful. Chimera. Their design is pure excellence, but they're also overpowered. Thanks, giant light down air hitbox. Thanks, Buff Dog. Buff Dog, Buff Dog, Buff Dog, Buff Dog. Mascot. This right here is what Smash Bros. Bowser should have been. The right amount of strength, speed, and firepower. Narrator. He's got a bunch of weird animal-inspired moves, including a super useful... Falcon! Dive. Nice one. Oh, and he's also got a rest. The game would have felt naked without one. Rival. She's actually got some great moves that combo really well together. Add on her volleyball spike and counter, and Helga became a character I really enjoyed. Plasma. Why is he so big? Also, his heavy up air is pretty powerful and super floaty. Makes for a spammable attack. SNAKE! She's super small, meaning she's difficult to hit and can be difficult to land hits with. Also, I know nothing about this thing other than she's supposed to be disgusting, I guess. I don't know, I had never heard of Ah Real Monsters before this game. Orb. Someone on the development team really liked Garfield, as you can tell by how good Garfield is. His moves are quick, rack up a ton of damage, and make me question, where's my pipe? Cheese. Another character who racks up a ton of damage quickly and has plenty of ways to finish his enemies off. In other words, he shreds the competition. Neo. Of course the teenage female character has a moveset with tantrum-inspired attacks. Pi. You meme lords get everything! And look at this guy! He's got a super floaty double jump, a pogo attack, and a freaking motorcycle! Squirrel. I will never remember what he can do because he was the last character added to a mediocre game who I only played with once the day he came out before getting footage for this video. I mean, he screams a lot with poorly balanced audio. If you understand why I addressed each character by those names, good for you. One more thing to touch upon is the character customization. It was non-existent at launch. There were no palette swaps or costumes. So if you had a mirror match or a free-for-all with everyone playing the same character, good luck telling who's who. Sure, we got costumes later on, but only one per character, with most being hats. That was not enough for variety's sake or to help distinguish each individual player. Even old arcade games had slight palette swaps. How did this game release without anything like that? I'm pretty sure you should already know how platform fighter stages work. 
When making the stage lineup for this game, the competitive focus meant there would be quite a few competitive friendly stages with simple, hazardless designs. But of course, there are still some stages with hazards and wacky layouts here and there, because sometimes those kind of stages can be fun too. Not all the time though. Let's see what we've got. Jellyfish Fields, it's Smashville. The Flying Dutchman Ship. How could you say no to a ghost ship stage? Glove World, just no. The poor layout, the constant hazards, the awful music, just no. Western Air Temple, a neat stage in visual and practical design. Omashu, so many platforms and carts, it's not fun to play on. Harmonic Convergence, Final Destination with Legend of Korra spoilers. The Loud House, oh like the show. Royal Wood Cemetery, before there would be gravestones that pop up like crappy hazards, but they were nowhere to be seen when getting footage for this review. Were they removed? Is this just another Final Destination now? Rooftop Rumble, just call this New York City. Also pretty cool visuals. Sewers Slam. Just call this the Sewers or the Turtle's Lair. Also, this is a stage where the hazard is literally shit. Technodrome Takedown. Just call this the Technodrome. Also, the moving platforms to the sides and above are neat, but are often too annoying to enjoy. Space Madness. This is the worst stage in the game. It's like it wanted to be a Pokefloats-esque stage, but the terrible platforms and the fact that they get pulled down the longer you stand on them makes this stage far worse than that joke of a stage. This shit is unplayable. Powdered Toast Trouble. A super long stage with a lot of unique stage elements and hazards that I can't help but love. Maybe because the long aspect of it reminds me of Melee's test stage. Urken Armada Invasion. It's Battlefield. Cat Dog's House. A stage where you can't tell what's the edge and what's still part of the ground. Showdown at Teeter Totter Gulch. That's a mouthful. And this is a super quicksand filled mess with too many rocking and swinging platforms. Wild Waterfall. So many platforms, but still so much empty space. Not a good one to fight on. Traffic Jam. Boring, but more practical Big Blue. Ghost Zone. The ceilings ruin this stage. The dump. Yep, the stage is a dump alright. Sweet dreams. I too dream of a hazardless Pokemon Stadium with junk food visuals. Slime time. The only reason this game has against being called Nicktoons All-Stars. Tremorton Joyride. A neat stage that routinely changes platform layouts. Duck Duck Pie. What the duck? Were Garfield's dreams not enough? And Hardcore Chores. It has a ceiling, so it's automatically terrible. I paid money for this crappy stage, are you fucking kidding me? Overall, the stage list is pretty decent. Just beware when you select random, because when it gets bad, there's a quit button for a reason. In regular versus matches, you can do either stock battles, timed battles, or sports battles. Stock and timed are as you'd expect if you're familiar with Smash. Sports is where they try to do their own thing. You either grab and throw or hit a ball into your opponent's goal. There are five different balls you can set for the match. Soccer balls that you can only interact with by hitting or walking into them. Footballs that you need to grab and throw. Tommy balls, which are just bouncier soccer balls. Yarn balls, which are very light and floaty. And plankton balls, which are very big and heavy. This is the coin battle of Nick All-Stars. A gimmick mode that you try for a couple matches and then never play again. It's fine, I guess, just not interesting or worth my time. You can do team battles for all of these and turn on items after they finally added items in an update. And the items here are fine, most being pretty generic and all being turned off by most players. They're fun for some and annoying for the rest. For the single player stuff, there's a training mode with a lot of neat features like CPU level testing, item spawning, hitbox display, and frame by frame mode. Nothing all that new, but good to have nonetheless. And then there's the fighting game staple, arcade mode. You select one of five difficulties, then go through a series of seven battles. Very easy sets all opponents to one life, 
Easy sets them to 2 lives, and Medium and Beyond sets them to 3 lives. Every battle, at every difficulty, you have 3 lives. I'd also expect the difficulty to come from stronger CPUs, but when testing CPU difficulties, I didn't notice any difference between the difficulty levels. Maybe there are no differences between levels, and it's all just a huge hoax relying on the placebo effect to create a false sense of varying difficulties. They also added this in-game speedrun timer that doesn't work right because while you'd expect something like this to only work while the player is actually playing, time gets added as soon as the match loads. Meaning it still counts the time you spend watching the entrance animations, hearing the announcer count down from 3, and listening to the character interactions. Oh yeah, there are character interactions. But they're less so interactions, and more so spewing of random popular quotes from each character that make no sense when used as dialogue for pre-match interactions. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, look at him go! A regular lightning bolt. Well, as far as capital go. What kind of place is this? Take that, you fiend! Great mask, by the way. But take that! I could go for something to eat. Could you use something to eat, dog? You are here because the outside world rejects you. All right, party people. I want to see you on the dance floor. I'll do this with my hands. It's better to be fashionable than functional. Mmm, cereal. Hey, what is this? Get it off of me! It's the happy helmet, Ren. Now you'll always be happy. Sorry, Mac. And yes, all of these were text only before finally getting voice acting in the game. One thing that I really appreciate is how the Ninja Turtles and Shredder use quotes from throughout various incarnations of their on-screen TMNT appearances. If you're a Turtles fan, just take a look at all of the arcade mode lines and see how many you can pinpoint the origins of. And no, I'm not going to go into detail about the Cut Jenny line. The less said about that, the better. All matches are 1v1s against random opponents on random stages, with each even battle letting you choose between two match setups. Upon completing arcade mode with a character, you unlock art for that character, an icon for that character, and the theme of that character's home stage to be listened to at any time through the game's soundtrack player. Lastly, there's online play. Here you can play 1v1 ranked matches where only competitive friendly stages are available. There's also quick play with or without nuts, I mean quick play and quick play with items where all stages are available. I actually couldn't get a single quick play match while getting footage, so that's something. You can also make private or public lobbies to make your own match rules and free play with friends online. The online gameplay experience is actually pretty great overall, as the implementation of rollback netcode makes matches play out super smoothly. Take notes, Smash Brothers. In the extras menu, you'll find the credits, low quality images of characters, background characters, and gameplay screenshots, the jukebox where you can listen to the game's soundtrack, move lists for all the characters, did you know Jenny has a move called Rocket Power? And any replays you saved. Looks like one of the playtesters was a Smash Machinima fan. All black. Wait, he was named Blackamar? I played the Nintendo Switch version because I find the idea of playing Smash clones on the only consoles you can play the Smash games on to be humorous. Because of that, I noticed a few strange occurrences that might not be present on other consoles, but they're still worth mentioning. Loading screens take forever, and during which you can sometimes hear audio scratch like audio glitches with the loading theme, and stage sound effects. When matches do load, they still have to make quick but noticeable adjustments before the match begins. There are also many instances of slowdown, like during a KO, during victory screens, which can also showcase some UI glitches, 
and on some stages like Slime Time and Space Madness. There were also some visual effect glitches and an audio glitch that I experienced for the first time when gathering footage. I don't know what caused this, but some menu sound effects were just completely muted and wouldn't go back to normal until I reopened the game. Going back to the promotional videos on Game Mill's YouTube channel, just because this is something that I really want to bring attention to because of how stupid it is. The description of the video announcing the paid DLC states that the DLC is free. That's literally false advertising, and I'm surprised that it was never fixed. I guess at this point, who cares really? Overall, there's some good fun to have here, but this was undoubtedly a flop. A product that tried to build hype through ideas alone, but ended up a rushed product that still feels unpolished. There was a lot that makes this game easy to call an embarrassment, but for what it is, I think that Spongebob scene from the beginning sums this up pretty well. It's ugly, flawed, messy but it's also proud of what it was able to be with all of the issues it had to overcome. With all of that in mind, I feel comfortable saying that this game That's right folks, longtime owner Mr. Krabs is opening a new restaurant called The Krusty Krab 2. Hello, I like money. What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Money. You've got to be kidding. I had the idea for this review in the works since the beginning of this year, but had to put it on the back burner in case there were any more updates after Rocco. But you know, months of silence later, and I think it's finally time to start drafting this review. A review that I plan to connect to that ugly and proud scene from Spongebob. That was something I really wanted to do because various appearances and words from the devs showcased how passionate they were for this game and how much they wanted it to perform well despite obvious setbacks from Nickelodeon and Viacom. They were obviously under strict deadlines and a low budget because Nick and Viacom were used to their modern crossover games being like the Nick Kart Racers games. Cheap, quick to make cash grabs. But the devs clearly had something else in mind. The ambition to make a quality game for gamers and casual cartoon fans that was worth having and enjoying. But then came the announcement of a sequel so soon after the first that completely ruins that idea. Nickelodeon All-Stars Brawl is ugly, so the sequel game can hopefully be a proud product. So all the hype and dedication towards the first game feels worthless now. Now this game is a $50, no, $50 plus dollar tech demo that despite several updates and additions after an empty release, still feels lacking. But that doesn't matter. Just pay another $50, no, $70, no, $80, maybe even more in the future if they include more paid DLC post-launch, and you'll get the game that the first one should have been. But because of the greedy, oblivious orange snot stain, the devs had to look like a bunch of fools for releasing this game in the state it was in with awkward pre-launch promo materials and late post-launch additions as last-ditch efforts to keep this game alive. And now they look even worse with a sequel this soon that has some skeptical on whether this will be a redemption game or a scheme to rake in another quick payday. Either way, people will feel betrayed by the barren and clunky first game. And because of that, there will already be hesitation and early negativity for Nick All-Stars 2. You're digging a grave for yourselves, Nickelodeon. But you don't care. Failures in the gaming space will never be enough to take down a successful cartoon company like Nick. But the graves you also dig for studios like Ludosity? You don't care about those either as long as you profit. I pre-ordered Nick All-Stars and its DLC. Admittedly, because they were on discounts during those times. But I actively refuse to buy Nick All-Stars 2 on day one. I and these poor devs have already been screwed over by Nickelodeon, so why should I jump straight into this Tailgater sequel? Squidward and the Ninja Turtles won't be enough to save you this time.
As always, thank you for watching. Don't forget to do the typical YouTube stuff if you enjoyed this video. Like the video, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and if you want to support the channel and get some neat perks, consider clicking the join button and seeing how you can become a channel member today.